Bibles this morning and turn to the book of Joshua, chapter 24. Joshua, chapter 24. Now, I've been here for seven years, and y'all know that it's extremely rare, extremely rare, that I use props. But today I just felt like I wanted to preach a message after reading and some stuff in first and second or in first Corinthians. Um, Paul makes reference in first Corinthians chapter two and in chapter three of three different types of people in the world. The three types that he mentions in the scriptures in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verses 10, 11, and 12 he talks about those who are spiritual. Upon receiving Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, the Holy Ghost moves in and you become a spiritual being. Then he mentions in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 1 he talks about that crowd who are carnal. And he said, I couldn't speak to you as unto spiritual because you were carnal. And then he makes mention of another group in chapter 2 and verse number 14. And the group that he mentions there are those that are natural. In other words, they've been born once and they are living in a natural human state, but they've not been born again. So they're not new creatures, never been saved, they don't know the Lord as their Savior. And so, I, of course, wanted to get some scripture to go along with it, and so I went to Judges chapter 24. And in Judges chapter 24, or excuse me, Joshua chapter 24, Joshua is about to go off the scene. And he gives Israel, if you will, one big pep talk in chapter 24 on the need to return to the Lord. The need to, if you will, to get your life right before God. And I do believe that's exactly where we are today, church. I believe we are at a place in the time scheme of things on God's calendar that it's time for you and I to get right with God. To get closer to God and to walk with God. Verse 15 of Joshua chapter 24. Very, very familiar scripture. Famous scripture. Most everybody knows it. He says, And if it seem evil to you, serve the Lord. Choose you this day whom ye will serve whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, now that is the Euphrates River before they crossed over, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. Now listen to what Joshua says. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. May we pray. Father, thank you for this day and your blessings. Lord, as always, we give you praise and glory for allowing us to come to your house. I pray, God, that everything we say and everything we do this morning would give glory and honor to you. For you are so, so worthy and so deserving. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for dying for, dying for us on an old rugged cross. And we thank you, Lord, that Jesus Christ arose the morning of the third day to give us that expected return that one day he's coming after us. We love you and thank you, and we pray that you would be made much of in this sermon. God, I pray that you would be highly exalted, and you would draw all men unto you. For it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. The truth of the matter is, everybody in this room, the reason I come up with the chairs is I thought, as I'm preaching, y'all going to be sitting. So I thought, there's three different types of chairs that we live in. As Paul pointed out, there is 
the spiritual crowd. Those who are committed to the Lord, committed to the Word, committed to the church. Then you've got the carnal crowd, the compromising crowd. This is the folks who have been saved, washed in the blood of the Lamb, names written down in the Lamb's Book of Life, but they're compromising on the things of God and taking up the things of the world. Then you have the last crowd, which is the natural crowd, and I named it the conflict crowd because they're in conflict with God, they're in conflict with the church, they're in conflict with the Word of God. And the truth of the matter is, every single person in this building and every single person watching on the internet, you are in one of those three chairs right now. Those who sit here are committed. God's number one. Jesus is number one. The Bible is the most important book that they have. Meeting with people of like faith to worship and praise God means everything to them. Then you've got the compromising crowd. That's the ones that's been saved. Their names are recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life. But they've sat down in a compromising position where God's not actually number one. And if we're really truly honest, we really don't have a relationship with Jesus, but we have an acquaintance with Jesus. He's not really our best friend, but he's somebody that we can call on in times of need. And so therefore, church doesn't mean as much to us. God doesn't, the Bible, we know what the Bible says. We believe what the Bible says, but we don't take it serious and we don't really live by it. And you've got the conflict crowd. Folks that sit here have never met Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They're unconcerned about the Bible. They're unconcerned about the church. And they're unconcerned and could really care less about God or Jesus or any spiritual matter whatsoever. And as I said, you're sitting in one of these three chairs right now. And the truth of the matter is, truly, really, only you know which chair you're sitting in. Because you see, I may look at you and I may look at your life and think, oh man, I know you're right here. You're in the committed chair. You've been committed. <laughs> that sounds good, don't it? You, you've committed your life to Christ. You, you put Him number one. And I know you're there, but the truth of the matter is you may be sitting there and think, well, really, that's not where I should be, preacher. I probably should be over here in this carnal chair. Because you see, I'm not walking as close to Jesus as I ought to, and I know that. <laughs> I don't take his word serious like I ought to, and I know that. And then there may be some that are sitting here in the conflict chair. You say, I don't, boy, what do you mean there? I mean, you've never really trusted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And so therefore, you're at conflict with God. You're in conflict with the world. Which chair are you in today? I don't want to take a lot of time because Wednesday night I told them I'd be 30 minutes and I went over an hour and I apologize for that. I apologize for going that long. So today I'm not going to be no hour. Mark it down. If I get over an hour, y'all raise your hand. <laughs> Ron's already going, that's enough. <laughs> Just got back, Ron. Great day. But when you study Joshua chapter 24... And Judges, the very next book, Judges chapter 1 and Judges chapter 2, you see all three of these chairs being filled up. If you will, in Joshua chapter 24, look at verse 31 with me. Now in verse 29, Joshua dies. He goes off the scene. In verse 31, the Bible says, And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that overlived, that means outlived Joshua, and which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. Now in that verse it says that after Joshua died, that all the elders, all the older folks, those who had been through the Red Sea, those who walked through the wilderness, those who had come over the, the Euphrates River and crossed that Jordan and went into this land, they knew the works of the Lord. They saw the hand of God. They heard about the hand of God. And so therefore... They're committed to God and serving God and not serving other gods. And that is that committed crowd. But then when you get into Judges, in the, first, all, the whole first chapter, 
is absolutely filled with those that compromise. You see, what happens is when you take some committed individual and when they go off the scene, this next crowd hasn't heard about all the good works of the Lord. They haven't heard about how God brought them through the Red Sea, the wilderness, and delivered them out of Egypt. Hadn't heard how he, they overcome all these Amorites and Canaanites and all these other ites. God had beat them. God had destroyed them. They haven't heard all that stuff, so they become compromisers. And as you start reading chapter 1 and you go on down all the way even into chapter 2, you find that we've got a crowd here that are, they were told by Joshua not to intermingle with the Canaanites and the Amorites, not to be with them, not to dwell with them, that you are separate people, thus saith the Lord. And when they move into the land, what's the first thing they do? They, they start compromising. They start bending a little bit and bowing a little bit. And the next thing you know, God comes with a warning to them. And he says, look, I'm going to judge you and I'm going to stand before you. And because of your unbelief, because you're unwilling to obey what thus saith the Lord, he said, I'm not going to remove them out of the land that's supposed to be yours. And so they're living in this compromised state. Children of God, yes. Walking with God, no. Then when you get into chapter 2, look at verse number 10 with me for a second. This is the conflict crowd. And also all the generations were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor the works which he had done for Israel. I personally believe with all of my heart that we're living in such a generation today as that one. We're living in a generation today in the United States of America that have forgotten God and have forgotten the works of God. And you and I are partially to blame. Because if we're honest, and I mean if we're really, really honest, if we were standing in the very presence of Jesus Christ right now, and He asked you, take a seat to the one in which you belong, I have to say, I believe the majority of us would come and sit down right here. Now folks, I love you enough that I'll get right in your face and tell you what thus saith the Lord and what God's told me. And I even put on the prettiest tie that I've got on in my closet, put iron my shirt this morning so I look pretty and sweet as I tell you the truth. God is telling you and telling me we need to get up from the chair with which we're in and we need to move over to a committed chair. You know, here's the difference. Let me go through a little list real quick. It's going to take long God. See, the group that's sitting in this right here chair called committed, God means everything to them. I mean absolutely, positively everything to them. God's number one. Jesus Christ means more to them than anything in the world. They're that committed. Let me tell you how to, how to have real 100% Christian joy in your life. The acronym J-O-Y. You put Jesus Christ first. He goes first in your finances. He goes first in your family. He goes first in your health. He goes first in anything and everything that you do. Then the O, J-O-Y. O stands for others. You put others before yourself. You're more concerned on their happiness and their well-being than you are your very own self. And of course, you's last. That's you. You put yourself last. And I guarantee you this. If you're a born-again Christian and you put Jesus first, others second, and yourself last, things will bring joy to your life like you've never seen it before. So that crowd right there looks at God and He means everything to them. But see, now this crowd that sits here in the compromise seat, they know God, they believe God, they trust God. And if you ask them, are you a Christian? They would answer, absolutely, yes, I am. And on the majority of cases, that would be 100% right. But the thing about it is, they're compromising on God. In other words, my job means a little bit more to me than Jesus does. 
My actually, and I know a lot of people look at this one as, as, as bad to say this, but my family means more to me than Jesus. And when you put your family in front of Jesus, that's not doing what the Bible says to do. And so we put our sports, our health, our cars, our houses, everything else goes first. Then we might slide Jesus in, but usually it's all about me. And that's the way it is for most of us. It's, um, it's more, I'm more concerned and more dedicated to making sure I'm happy and I'm well fed and I'm taken care of than I am anybody else. When it comes to the third crown, they don't give God a thought. That's like today. Today the Bible... You know, I want to say something real quick. This is not the Sabbath. Yesterday was the Sabbath. Today is the Lord's Day. It's the day that the disciples come up with after Jesus rose the first day of the week, which is Sunday. It became the Lord's Day. And so these folks that sit in this chair right here, they get up, God doesn't, they don't give God a second thought. Most of the time they go through a 24-hour period and the only time they think of God is when they say a curse word, if you know what I mean. Other than that, God never comes into the picture. Jesus never comes into the picture. They could care less about an old rugged cross. They could care less about the Word of God or anything to do with God because God just doesn't mean anything to them at all. When it comes to the Bible, this group right here believes this is the inerrant, infallible Word of the living God. They believe every word from the beginning to the ending. They put it way ahead of any newspaper or magazine or any CNN, Fox, or anybody else on TV. What God said is the truth. And I'm going to tell you something, folks. I believe every single word that's in this book. I believe if God promised it, it will happen. Take it to the bank. Amen. This group right here believes the Bible. But unlike this crowd, see this crowd that's sitting here in this committee chair, they don't only believe it, they try to live it. See the crowd in this seat right here, this compromising seat, they believe every word, they believe everything that God said, but they just ain't really dedicated to living it. Ooh, that hurts, don't it? Because every one of us have to say at some point or another, ouch, that includes me. This last group, this ain't even a book. This is man-made fables and stories is all it is to the group that sits in that chair. Let me do one more. Morals, values, and the worldly system. If you're sitting in this chair right here, when you see things that are going on in this world today, you shake your head as if I feel like an alien. I don't feel like I belong here no more. You ever get that one? Yes. You ever what? I mean, when, you know, Numbers, no, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 22, I believe it is. I believe it's chapter 22. Somewhere around verse 4 or 5. I think it's verse 5. The Bible says, now listen to what I'm saying here. The Bible says that a woman shall not wear clothing that pertaineth to a man. And a man shall not wear clothing that pertains to a woman. Now here's what I'm saying. That means I don't come to church next Sunday dressed in one of Sandra's dresses. And I put on her makeup. And get all prettied up. I don't need prettied up, amen. <laughs> I, that means I don't put on her dresses and wear her clothing. And that means she doesn't go into my closet and get out one of my suits and put on one of my suits and come to church next Sunday. Now, this stuff that some people preach about, well, a woman shouldn't wear pants because that's made for a man. No, it wasn't. Do your history. Study the pants that were created. They weren't created just for men. End of story. I ain't going to discuss that. That's a completely different sermon. But yet we watch stuff today that Teresa told me yesterday. She sent me a message. She said, they've hired somebody down here that's a he-she. Now I don't know if it's a he wants to be a she or she that wants to be a he. I don't know and I don't care. Because I'm here to tell you, you can sit here and say you are a male, but you identify with a woman all you want to. That don't make you a woman. And vice versa. 
<laughs> I mean, we live in a world today where, you know, I thought the other day, I thought, well, I'm just going to go to the Washington, D.C., knock on the White House and say, hey, I associate myself as the Vice President of the United States, so let me in so I can help make some decisions. What do you think they'd do to me? I'd be on national TV arrested and taken to prison, amen? But yet, you can, you know, that, it, this junk about letting high school athletes that are males participate in female sports is about the most idiotic, stupid thing I've ever heard in my life. And anybody that's sitting in this chair who believes this book would say, Amen. I agree. But some of the folks that are sitting in this chair say, Well, you know, people have a right. There's a, somebody that we know, Sandra and I know real good, that keeps saying the words, Just let me be me. You know, those are dangerous words. Amen. In other words, instead of saying, just let me be me, I ought to say, let me be whatever God wants me to be. And if you were born a male, God does not want you to be a female because his word, that, that same passage that I read there, or quoted that says, man don't wear woman's clothes, woman don't wear man's clothes, and it said, and if you do, you are an abomination before God. See, the crowd that says here does not believe in gay marriage. Because the Bible says it's an abomination. That a man should not lie with a man and a woman should not lie with a woman. But the group that's here, even though they believe the Bible, they say, well, you know, I've got a first cousin or I've got a sister or I've got a brother or I've got somebody that is gay and I want them to like me so I'm going to go along with it. That's compromising. Well, you get to this last group, they could care less what you wear or how you act or how you dress. They just don't care about any of the morals. When you go back to this group over here, when it comes to abortion, they believe abortion is murder. They believe that when you... You know what the Bible says? The Bible says in, in Proverbs chapter 6, These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are abomination. Do you know what, what verse number 17 says? Hands that shed innocent blood. Can I ask you a question? How much more innocent can you get than a baby in the womb of its mother. Helpless as can be. Innocent as can be. And they are murdering these babies by the millions every single year in the name of the United States of America. And people that are sitting here say, I don't agree with it. I don't like it. You shouldn't be using my tax money to pay for murdering babies. This group right here says, well, you know, it is a woman's choice. It is her body. Really? This group right here says, kill them all. They just don't care. Now I want to draw this, bring it in to you right now. Which chair are you in? Because you're sitting in one of them three chairs right now. Ask yourself this question. If I came to your children, or your grandchildren, or your wife, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your husband, you know, whoever. I want you real quick, just pop it up in your brain. Who knows you better on this earth, family-wise, friend-wise? Who knows you better than anybody? Okay? If I went to that person that knows you better than anybody in all the world, and I give them a card, and it's got three boxes. The first box says committed, the next box says compromised, and the next box says conflict. And I'm going to pick on Jason because he looked at me with one of them looks. If I come to Madison and I hand Madison a card, and I said, Madison, on this card right here, it says these three boxes that are listed, committed, compromised, and conflict. You've heard the message that I preached. Let me ask you a question. Nobody's going to know this but just me. I won't share it with your mama. I won't share it with your daddy. I won't share it with nobody else. Just, I just want you to know, which box is your daddy? Would she write, oh, he's committed? Or would she say, well, he compromises on some things. and You know, he, he don't take church real serious. And he don't take the Bible real serious. And 
He is saved. I believe he's saved, but he, you know, and I'm not trying to pick on Jason. Just he's got that get off me look right now. So I thought I'd just. And think about it, each and every one of you. If, if, if I went to each and every one of you, the person that knows you best, and I said, mark down which box you're in. You know, there may be some that would kind of check a little bit here and a little bit here. Well, most of the time he's committed. Most of the time she's committed. Most of the time they take God's word serious and the church serious and things of the Lord. Most of the time they pray and they, they put it, man, they're committed. But you know, there's some time when every single one of us are sitting in this chair. And here's where the rubber meets the rubber. In less than two chapters, from Joshua 24, and then it goes directly into Joshua chapter 1, Joshua chapter 2, we go from a group that is totally committed to God and God's Word and doing what thus saith the Lord, which is sitting here, Chapter 2, verse 10, you get a generation that knew not the Lord. Didn't know nothing about God. You know how that happens? When this group right here slips into this chair, and when they start teaching their kids that basketball and football and baseball and dance and all this other stuff is way more important than the house of God. That don't worry so much about being on time for Sunday school or don't worry about Wednesday night. I know you've got football and basketball and I know all that's so important so don't worry about that. We can compromise a little bit on the Word of God. Do you know that studies reveal that moms and dads, when they're 100% committed to God and God's Word in the house of God, that their children... Almost 90% of their children raised up will stay in the church and they will stay committed. Now sometimes it doesn't happen, but most of the time it does. The group that sits here, the ones that compromise, are the ones that take it kind of serious but not real serious. Less than 50% of their kids will remain dedicated to the house of God. Less than 50% of their kids will get involved and stay in the church and be committed Christians. And of course, this group that sits over here, unless God intervenes and unless God moves in, they don't have a chance to become committed born-again Christians. Every now and then it will take place. Every now and then it will happen, but very rare. So you see, if you're sitting in this chair right now, God wants you to get up and come to this chair. If not for yourself, do it for your children and your children's children. You say, well, preacher, my kids are old and grown and got their own families and out of the house. Yep, that's true. But a lot of you grandparents are around your grand young an awful lot. Do your grandparent, do your grandkids, do they see Jesus in your life? Do they see that you're dedicated to God and the Word and the church? Do they see that Jesus comes first more than anything and everything else? Because I'm telling you, if you don't live it, if you don't teach it, the school's going to teach them something completely opposite. And the world and the world system is going to teach them completely opposite from what thus saith the Lord. And we're living in the last days. We're living in the days before Christ comes to the church. And I'm here to tell you something. We need to get out of these two chairs. We need to be committed, born again, Bible-believing Christians before it's too late. I'm going to ask you to stand on your feet, heads bowed, eyes closed all over the building.